Christ and welcome to Fire Fall 2020. Today we're going to look at one of the great realities of the Feast of Pentecost. You know, the narrative of Pentecost is packed with power. But sometimes we have a tendency of looking at just the outward signs that come out in the upper room, whether it's the tongues or the fire or the wind. And while all of these have their rightful place, the most significant aspect of Pentecost is what happens after the signs are manifested. It's almost as if to say God knows that we are so visually oriented. He first gets our attention and then He gives us a revelation. The revelation of declaring Jesus is Lord. You know, having lived in the Middle East for more than 15 years, I remember in the beginning the word Lord to me just spelled kingship. Qatar is ruled by a king and we see his visible leadership, we see his power, his authority, and how each one of us is called to submit to that power. But when I became a Christian in 2004, the aspect of that authority and that lordship took on a new meaning. I was taken completely by surprise. And so we hear that this narrative of Pentecost, you find that in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 41, where Peter rises to his first evangelical speech. He first starts quoting the fulfillment of the prophet Joel. But then it seems like he is hurried to get to a point. In verse 22, he says, You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. And once he gets their attention, he pronounces a name in the full authority of the Holy Spirit, Jesus of Nazareth. Now what is Peter doing when he is announcing Jesus that way, Jesus of Nazareth? He's making them remember. He's making them remember this man who was a part of their lives. This man who healed them and delivered them. This man who went about doing good. And once he gauges from the crowd, ah, okay, now I remember this man. He almost, it's like he shoots a proclamation. You killed him. God has raised him from the dead. In verse 36, he says, Let the whole house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you have crucified. Lord and Messiah. Lord and Messiah. You know, the English word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiha. We say sometimes Messiah. Or the anointed one and what Peter is doing right now is he's making a correction he's telling the people this is not your version of the Messiah this Jesus of Nazareth he is Messiah not just of the house of Israel but of the whole world the second word that Peter uses is the word Lord in the Jewish world the name of God was Yahweh it was so sacred that they could not even bring it to their lips. In fact, when they saw a word in writing, they would say Adonai, Kyrios, which means my Lord, affirming the power of one God. What is Peter saying here? He's telling them, this Jesus of Nazareth, he is that God. Not only is he Messiah, but he is Yahweh, literally Yahweh in person, come to send his people. It is this Lord, my dear friends, that the apostles preached with fire and fervor in the early Christian days. It was not easy at all. In fact, when you see Paul's missionary journey, you can see the great cost of preaching Jesus is Lord. It was very, very challenging to use the word Lord in charismatic significance because it brought so much fear. There were other lords there. So you can imagine the words of St. Paul when he writes about Jesus. In Colossians 1, He is the image of the unseen God, the firstborn of all creation. Through Him, all things come to be. Where the thrones of rulers or powers or authorities, He is before all things. And in Him, all things are held together. Those words, my dear friends, were written against the backdrop of Roman power. Paul is saying, not Caesar, you know, not Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Which Jesus is this? It is Jesus crucified. Paul is saying, I submit to a king crucified. 
crucified. No wonder no one understood this because it was beyond human reasoning. That is why we see, my dear friends, that the early church paid for with their lives in declaring this lordship. But in their martyrdom, they teach us that God's power has nothing to do with worldly gain, but everything, my dear friends, to do with self emptying love. It didn't make sense then, and it doesn't make sense to us today. We who live in a modern, selfish, secular world. To say that Jesus was Lord means that He deserves our full commitment. You know, some months ago, I remember. Um, reading those beautiful lines, if Jesus is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. What it meant to say is, we can't say Jesus is Lord in one aspect of our lives where we need his help, but in other aspects of our lives, he remains just a moral, historic, religious figure because we refuse to submit under his Lordship. To say that Jesus is Lord, he must unambiguously become the center of our lives. You know, we live in a world where we submit to these various gods, money, power, possessions, lust. We live in a pop culture generation where we are following idols and icons. To say Jesus is Lord, my dear friends, is to mean that all other gods are dethroned from our lives. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3 tells us, No one can say Jesus is Lord unless through the power of the Holy Spirit. Of course, we can mouth those words, but unless we live in the power of the Holy Spirit, those words, my dear friends, they become only words. It is only the Holy Spirit who convicts us that the power of our proclamation must be accompanied by a personal decision. It is not enough to say, Jesus is Lord of life, but rather, or more importantly, is Jesus the Lord of my life? When I look at my own conversion moment in 2004, I realize it was so easy to say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. But in the months that followed my conversion, in the years that followed my conversion, in the poor choices that I made, it was self-evident that Jesus did not have reigns of my life and therefore how grateful we are to the gift of the Holy Spirit who is so patient with us sinners he convicts us he guides us he counsels us he enables me every single day to die to myself in order that I can live for him he enables me every single day to loosen the grip of power that I want to hold in my life if Jesus is Lord of my life then I must say it with conviction and I must also reflect is he Lord of my life, my home, my marriage, my parenting, my decisions, my lifestyle, do they reflect his Lordship? One aspect of the catechism that I absolutely love is what it says, you know, it says for a Christian to reign is to serve, to reign is to serve. What a powerful witness in a world that is driven to self-power and self-gain. You know, the power that Jesus came to exercise, my dear friends, is through the weapon of love. We call that kenosis, self-emptying love. And we see him on the cross, hands and feet are nailed, body broken beyond recognition. Everything is stripped from his life. He doesn't even have his dignity available. And there on the cross, my dear friends, he gazes upon the world and he gives away control, power, even when he is Lord of heaven and earth. When I say Jesus is Lord, does my life reflect the self empty power? We bring ourselves, you know, to beautiful words of Pope Francis. I think he's done such a marvelous job in just bringing us time and time again to that aspect of discipleship. What does it really mean to be a Christian? And he says to have power is to serve. To have power is to serve. He brings us back to the kingdom principles. Those principles that tell us if you're first, you've got to be last. If you have power, you have to first be a servant. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. 
He convicts us and He gives us those paradigm shifts and He challenges our lip service. Don't just say, Lord, Lord, and not do what Jesus says. And even there, when we fail, He never fails to bring us back. It is very challenging, my dear friends. I can tell you from my own life, having to balance and home and ministry and the challenges of ministry, it is so challenging to say, Jesus, I give you full reign of my life. We need courage and we need a power beyond our own. That is what God gives us. In His great kindness, He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us courage to truly say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. You know, the narrative of Pentecost ends with like, you know, it's this beautiful, beautiful thing. When Peter declares that Jesus is Lord, scripture says 3,000 people were converted in that one moment, in that one day, because the word of God cut through their hearts. And burning with that conviction of the Holy Spirit, they begin to ask, what must we do? What must we do? And Peter replies, repent and be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In repenting, my dear friends, we turn away from our ways of thinking to his ways of thinking and in our baptism we make the choice to die to ourselves in order to give him the reign over our lives that is the miracle of Pentecost and so today I invite you right where you are regardless of failure regardless of your sin remember God's power is greater than your weakness greater than failure if you fail to make Jesus the Lord of your life in its true entirety, I invite you once again to that commitment, once again to the declaration to make Jesus, you are Lord of my life.